Welcome to the How Not to DM Season 2 Finale. I'm your host, Derek. Thanks for joining me this season on my quest to interview the very best Dungeon Masters on this plane of existence. Before we get started, I need to shout out my newest patrons, Callum and DM Benjamin. Thanks so much. As a note to all of my patrons, I'm going to pause the payments for the next couple months in between seasons, but I'll pick back up with exciting announcements as my Season 3 kickoff is scheduled and ready to reveal. If you'd like to support the show, want a shout out on my Season 3 kickoff episode, or want an inside scoop on who's coming up in Season 3, consider joining. You can find the link in my link tree, or by heading to patreon.com slash hn, the number 2, DM. Remember that 10% of my ad and patron money goes to support local LGBTQ plus youth via Encircle. Check out my link tree for more information about Encircle and all their great work. One last thing before we begin. In my link tree, there is a link to a feedback survey and I'll be tweeting that link out periodically as well. If you could take a couple of minutes of your time and go fill out that survey, that'll help me a ton in planning what I'm going to do for season three. Maybe there's stuff you like or don't like about the show, and I really want to know so I can make it even more interesting and engaging and useful for you. So please go fill that out, and if you have any other feedback you'd like to give me, my DMs are always open. Thanks. And now, on to this very special Season 2 finale episode's guest intro. Tanya DePass, known as Cypher of Tear, is one of the most experienced TTRPG stream producers on this plane of existence. Tanya helped kickstart Rivals of Waterdeep, one of the longest-running official D&D streams, now in its 13th season. She also helped create and produce Into the Motherlands, an all-POC TTRPG live stream using a totally original story and game mechanics created specifically for the show. If you'll recall, in my Season 1, I interviewed Cam Banks, the creator of the Cortex system. They used the Cortex system as kind of a basis for the system they built for Into the Motherlands. B. Dave Walters, one of my other season one guests, was also heavily involved in Into the Motherlands, but Tanya is the one who invited all those people and helped make it happen. When Tanya isn't creating new shows, she is a journalist, activist, and founder of the nonprofit organization I Need Diverse Games. Enjoy! I was gonna be sarcastic and be like, I was born in a small cottage on a river, but no. But Lifelong Chicagoan, you know, been gaming most of my life, you know, started with D&D First Edition, and you know, I'm arcade years old as well, grew up with the arcades and Satanic mm. Panic. So you grew up like just south of where the game really started then, south yeah. and east, huh? Midwest, yeah. Yep, Chicago born and raised. Now I'm a professional D&D player, DMer, RPG creator. I stream on Twitch. I do a lot of DNI consulting, both in the video game sphere and the tabletop sphere. And I'm making a game that'll be out TBD because, well, the pandemic and life happens. Yeah. The good news is I don't think anyone's holding you to any deadlines, just like no one wants. <laughs> You'd be surprised <laughs> with the way people act on Kickstarter. Uh, I guess I could see that. Yeah. Kickstarter is a different animal. You mentioned you started playing first edition. Can you tell us a little bit about, yeah, that kind of journey of getting into playing TTRPGs? I started early, you know, had friends that were nerdy and we got into it, but I I had to uh, do the whole, I'm not going to play d and I'm going to study with my friends and, you know, played and went through 3.5. And then I kind of fell off between the campaign I was in, the very long IRL campaign I was in ending. And then just work life. And also, there weren't a lot of people like me that I saw playing the game. You know, yeah. streaming wasn't really a thing during the heyday of 3.5. And I kind of ignored Pathfinder and didn't come back till, uh, you know, shout out to Greg Tito over at Wizards. He had me on Dragon Talk. And we, and we talked about the very thing of why did you, you know, drop off RPGs? And I was like, I don't see people like myself in the book. You know, when I go in game stores, I get the dirty look of like, what are you doing here? Or, oh, a girl, she must be lost. And then, you know, I was on Dragon Talk and he showed me the iconic human who is a dark skinned black woman mm. in proper paladin armor. And I was like, I'm sold. I'm coming back. 
That's awesome. So that's that's what got you back in. Yeah, I love Greg and and Shelly. They're they're both great, and uh, Dragon Talk's a great show too. But uh, I'm glad that he reached out to you then and got you back in because you've done so many cool things since. As far as running games, then do you remember the first game that you ran? And if not, do you kind of remember some details about it, about the experience or stuff that you might have run into when you were trying it out for the first time? I don't remember my first DM experience, but I know I was nervous. I was afraid I was going to mess it up. I was very by the book and I was like, wow. And then the players do what players do and and threw all of that out the window. And I was like, oh, I have to improv now because you have totally diverted from where I was going. It was stressful. I mean, I, I remember more recent DMing a lot more clearly but it yeah. took me a long time to get comfortable DMing. And sometimes I'm still not. Like, I just ran a game last night for charity. And I still am, like, checking out, like, did you all have fun? Was it okay? Was this for Jasper's Game Day? Uh, no, the Jasper's Game Day game is going to be Wednesday, May 12th. Ah, that's coming up. Okay. Yep. Yeah. As we record, yes. Tomorrow, in fact. Wow. Yes. There it is. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well. In maybe more recent memory then, or or um, longer ago, if you can recall, what are some of the big mistakes you feel like you made or have made as a DM or a GM? Could be any system as well. It doesn't have to be specifically D and D, but yeah, some some big stuff that you did, and then you're like, oh, I can't do that again, or you know, whatever uh, stuff you might have run into that that you had to learn tough lessons from. Um, definitely over preparing. I was a DM that tried to prepare for every eventuality had like all my books and notes. And then again, as players are wont to do here, I prepared this nice tasty adventure for you. You're like, screw that. We're going to like go down this path where you didn't prepare anything and find the random orc NPC. You didn't even give a name. And also, you know, trusting that the players are not trying to be malicious. And I say that I know mm. someone may listen to this and go, what the hell are you talking about? But Early on, all I kept hearing was this kind of us versus them mentality about DMs. And I didn't treat the players that way, but I had to remember that we're all adults. Nobody here is out to give anyone a hard time on purpose, at least not the tables I was at. And, you know, also just not be suspicious of my players of like, why did you do that? Why do you want to do this thing? And learning the hard lessons of trust at the table and uh, the season of Rivals of Waterdeep I did, it was hard because I had a plan and true to fashion, they screwed up that plan within like one episode of the season and then continually throughout the season of, I'm trying to get you to go this way, this way. And they would constantly go way to the other side of the ocean in a matter of speaking. And I'm just like, oh my yeah. God. And, you know, it's hard because I, this is a personal fault. I get frustrated very easily. <laughs> so trying not to get super frustrated when I have my best laid plan and it does not go that way. I still struggle with that a little bit. It's tough, right? I mean, like you said, especially when you were newer, you're putting so much work into the prep and into the, the thought behind what was going to happen. And it's hard to not feel like they're intentionally trying to mess with you at the beginning, right? Yeah. You're like, but I put so much work into this. Why are you doing this? And yeah. yeah, it takes a while to kind of get into a better mentality of, yeah, so long as, you know, like you said, you've got that trust with your players, you can realize, all right, they're not trying to <laughs> torpedo everything I've done here. Yeah, it, it's tough, though. I mean, granted, I'm in some discords where people have told horror stories of, if not a DM, then another player actually being very intentionally confrontational yeah. and aggressive and trying to torpedo plans. Mm. But, you know, also, I'm sure in the era that we grew up in, safety tools didn't exist. Right. Session zeros didn't exist. They should have, but they didn't. And, you know, even in the era of having safety tools and session zeros, some people still don't do them. That is one thing that I think can mitigate a lot of the fear and a lot of that. We're at the table of people I may or may not know that well. Yeah. And just how do you deal with all the different personalities at a table? Yeah, it's true. Uh, there definitely is like a camp of people who think that that's the point is to like, try to be as malicious and as difficult as possible. Mm -hmm. I definitely try not to play with those people. 
Yeah. And it's usually pretty easy to spot them. I haven't had to kick a player out of a game that I've run before, so I've been pretty lucky. But yes, they do exist. Yeah, you're right. Most of the time, the people that I've played with have been friends and family. And so it's easy for all of us to get along, to have uh, the same expectations and, and to make sure that we're all playing something that is enjoyable. But like you said, you're playing games with people you don't know that well. Your charity game was probably some strangers in there, right? People that you, oh, you've yeah. never met before. So it can be tough and you definitely do have to be careful. But like you said, safety tools, session zero, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff can help avoid um, any problems that you might run into. Cool. Good lessons. Good lessons. As far as fun moments that uh, have come from games that you've run or games that you've played in, what are some of the, the best moments that you can think of of playing role-playing games? Uh, well, two come to mind. One is uh, actually I was DMing Dragon Age on a friend's mm. channel, and most of the players knew about Dragon Age. They played the video games, knew the property in some way. One of our players did not. And uh, Gabe Hicks, bless him, the troll <laughs> that he is, decided to tell everyone that there was a fertility ritual they had to participate in. And they had to go into this lake or this well and the player who didn't know anything about Dragon Age thought there were actual lore reasons about it. You know what? You all role play this out. I'm just going to sit here with my drink. And it was like, I can sit here and think about how is this going to come back and bite them later? Because you're off frolicking in the water and there's all this stuff happening because we said it during the Inquisition. And then as a DM, one of the others is... Running the Infernal Goose Chase, because something that I wrote, you know, the terrible goose game where you're goose stealing stuff from people and the creature's homegrown or homebrew. They wind up dead or in Avernus, have to fight the goose and get out. That's the very TLDR of it. And just the ways people will go out of their way, either not have any combat, just get back to the world of the living. Or they're like, oh, we're taking that goose. And I'm like, so you're going to kill an infernal creature. and take some of its meat with you to the mortal plane. Let me just make sure I heard you. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, just, just don't mind me taking a, taking a little note. The other one that brought me a lot of joy was I did dungeon crossing, which was playing D and D, but using animal crossing. Oh yeah. It's totally Gary Wood's fault. Cause he did animal talking. And he mentioned when I was a guest that he'd never learned to play D and D. I was like, oh, really? I'll teach you. And so got him and a few other people. We basically, our Animal Crossing characters sat in a dungeon in my ACNH home and played D&D. &D. And Shannon bamboozled some dire wolves so that they did not have to have combat. I was like, it's problem solving. I was trying to get you some XP, but sure, I'm just going to run with it. Yeah, I'll be honest. When my players fool me, you know, and, and break the game in ways that I didn't anticipate, I'll still give them the, the experience, you know. Good yes, on I you. Hear. Yeah. I didn't think you could bamboozle a dire wolf, but here we are. Oh, that's so fun. As far as people that you look up to, DMs and GMs, who are some of the people who you look up to and who have influenced the way you run your games? Definitely B Day Walters, because. I've got the chance to watch him in person DM. I get to play with him every week on Black Dice Society. Oh, you got to go to the G4 TV set? That's fun. Yeah. You know, beside me, Dave, I know a lot of people who work there and I was in town and it was just a chance to to watch him in person. Because also, for those who don't know, B. Dave is not a small man. He is six foot nine. So someone of that stature and that energy to run a game hit commercial beats, be interesting, make sure everyone's having a good time and not get bogged down in, you can't do this, look up the spell, because not everyone on the cast was familiar with D&D. &D. Yeah. Like Ify Narawade is, you know, he plays, other people play, but for the most part, everyone on the show was new to D&D &D as well. Kind of like uh, Rivals of Waterdeep when we started, everyone, there was a mix of experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just... Getting to watch the master, and I, I don't say that lightly, and just his presence and the way he can think and just all the things that he does. But, you know, not just B. Dave, but Mark Meir, Jasmine Bular, Eugenia Vargas. Uh, I know that Brian Gray will be surprised to hear his voice because he's only DM'd once. 
But the opening scene he did with my character talking to Tyr, I was like, that was amazing. He was like, oh, that was improv. I'm like, excuse me? And you said you were worried about DMing. I beg your pardon. Definitely uh, Gabe Hicks, Amy Dolan, mm. uh, and especially like watching and in terms of like people that I know personally, uh, Jasmine Bular, just watching her, the way her mind works and like the seamlessness in which she goes back and forth on voices on the show that she does on her channel. Shakar is just amazing. Yeah, she is really talented. Love watching those. And now a word from How Not to DM's sponsors. Let's start off with Gemmed Firefly. Need a fresh look for the new year? Head on over to gemmedfirefly.com for the newest tees, mugs, and home goods styled with D&D gamer humor and aesthetics. As always, Gemmed Firefly makes every shirt to order, bringing you all of the softest and most comfortable shirts that thousands have come to love. Listeners of the show get a discount when you use the code DRAGON at checkout. Find your new favorite shirt at gemmedfirefly.com now. And Delve Candles. At Delve Candle Company, we make immersive candles with custom blended scents that will add atmosphere and ambiance to your next game session. Our scents evoke settings or moods commonly encountered by adventuring parties, and our candles are 100% soy wax for a clean burning experience. Visit our website at www.delvecandles.com and subscribe to our mailing list for 10% off your next purchase. Adventure awaits for those who delve. As a personal note here from Derek, I've used Delve Candles recently and my players loved it. I recommend the Bag of Scent Holding, which is a variety pack of a bunch of different smaller candles that'll burn for a few hours so you can kind of test out the ones that you like most. And then you can buy the big three wick ones later when you're ready to make that purchase. So yeah, check out Delve Candles. And lastly, podcasteditors.online and videoeditors.online. Are you a podcaster or video content creator who loves making awesome content but wishes you spent less time editing and more time doing the things you love? Check out podcasteditors.online or videoeditors.online to see their awesome rates and editing offerings. Buy a few hours a la carte or purchase bulk hours for larger projects. Let them tackle the boring stuff so you can get back to making more awesome content. Check out the links in the episode notes for both podcasters and video creators. And now, let's return to the show, starting up with a brand new minigame for Season 2. This week on Quickfire Chaos, Tanya and I are going to use some D100 tables and random dice rolls to create a quest giver scenario to roleplay. We are now moving on to the mini game. So, uh, get those D100s ready. You're going to roll on four different random tables. First three are to build an NPC that you're going to play. And then the final one is the quest you're going to send me on. So it's just like a quick little role play. I show up, I say, hi, you got a job for me. And you say, yes, it's this job. And you kind of just use some of the the stuff that we rolled to flesh out the NPC. All right. First one is uh, the voice. And this is just like how they sound. It's not the accent. So I'm not going to make you do something random. So, yeah. So the first one is a 71. Speaks in a morbid, dark tone. Tends to enunciate words. That's just my daily speaking voice. I think you're good to go. All right. Uh, What's our next one? Next one is job. Ooh. Oh, my God. It's literally all zeros. 100? Yep, 100. Barber. So I'm Sweeney Todd, basically. Yeah, you are. I was going to say, that sounds familiar. I'm Sweeney Todd. Good job. Cool. Personality trait. 51. Impish, naughtily, or annoyingly playful. Yeah, it fits the bill again. There you go. So I'm kind of sort of swinging tie, but on uppers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last thing is the city quest that you need us to complete for you. 42. 
A bit of food sold to the party, cake, pie, soup, etc., suddenly has a humanoid pinky finger found. <laughs> I'm going to say that you have found this food with the finger in it, and so you're okay. asking us to figure out who put it there. That is so weird. The wow. dice are haunted. Yes, it's written in the stars. Okay, I'm going to play a big dumb paladin because that sounds good. I'll do a a human paladin. I'm in really shiny, like way too shiny armor. You oh, know, no. I've got the big sword on my back and I've got this righteous vigor in my soul. And so I'm going to knock on your door and uh, and see. So I'll, I'll like say I saw the posting on a job board. Or yeah. Okay, cool. Who is it? Hello there. Uh, yes, it is uh, Sir Gallivant here. I uh, saw a posting on the job board that... The barber needed some assistance, and I am here to provide. Ha ha! Hmm. So you saw my posting? Yes, I did. It's right here. Took it down. Hmm. Hopefully you can finish this posting. After all, you took it down, and no one else can read it now. Come in. Ah, thank you. Thank you. And I turn and, and grab this wrapped pie that is on my table and turn around and with a unnecessary flourish this this pie it has a finger in it uh sorry uh, can you say that again i i think i heard you say it has a finger in it a finger a finger yes a finger oh my what a dastardly deed who has done this well if i knew i wouldn't have put the posting up now would Ah, I am beginning to follow. Yes? Yes. You're a paladin. Who do you follow? <sighs> I serve our lord, Bahamut, the Platinum Dragon. Hmm. Interesting. So you, Sir Gallant, your charge is to see where this finger came from and who it belongs to, and how it got into my pie. Yes, sir. I shall start with where you bought it from. Where did you acquire this pie? Oh, down at the pasta shop for Mrs. Lovett. Very well, my first lead. And he uh, pulls out a piece of parchment <laughs> and starts scribbling down and, you know, <laughs> getting ready to go on this hunt. And he stuffs it back into his breast pocket and says, uh, Anything else I should know? You're not getting paid unless you solve this. Agreed. Agreed. I think that's a, a fair... Fair term. Well, I shall go and I shall find where this finger has come from, and I will return and let you know. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, good day. I shall return swiftly. Ho ho! Offward! And I just <laughs> shut the door and go back to what I was doing. <laughs> Perfect. That was great. <laughs> Mrs. Lovett, we'll see what terrible things she's cooking. So now we're kind of transitioning to your work in the TTRPG space um, and some other fun stuff that's been happening lately. So first of all, you've mentioned Rivals of Waterdeep. It's one of the longest mm -hmm. running actual play TTRPG streams. So I'd love to know about how it started and then what kind of stuff you've learned from producing it and being such a big part of it. Maybe some of the good parts and maybe some of the more difficult parts. Rivals Wardeep is Greg Tito's fault in the best way. Um, he reached out because we, we became friends. We stuck mm -hmm. in contact after I was on Dragon Talk. He said, hey, you're starting a new show to show off how easy it is for people to learn to play D&D &D with 5th edition. Would you be interested in do you know anyone else? So I reached out to some friends and we were doing the show locally mm -hmm. until, you know, the pandemic. We premiered at... D&D Live in 2018, uh, June 1st will be our fourth anniversary of the show. And we started off with the new Dragon Heist adventure where we uh, met Martha Moneylender, solved some puzzles, came back, and what was technically our premiere became fourth episode. So we kind uh -huh. of retconned or went backward to how we all met, etc. And every year they keep letting us come back for more seasons, so... You know, we've changed casts over time. Uh, Carlos Luna and Serena Marie 
who were founding members are now out in California. Serena works for Critical Role. Carlos works for Role 20. We've had some people just kind of, you know, they felt their time was up. They left the show. And now we're definitely a remote show. So even if Corona ended tomorrow, we couldn't really do the show together. Unfortunately, we have had one live show together. At PAX Unplugged last year, we did our season 11 finale Mm. live in front of an audience and streamed. Yeah, it's just been a wild ride of of learning how to put a show together, all the moving parts you don't think about for an actual play, because my streaming experience up until that point was just video games. I'd get on, either be on my console, be on PC, stream a game, do whatever. There's a lot more moving parts in terms of streaming an actual play show. And uh, being in a studio versus at home are two big differences. I mean, I've learned a lot. One is it's really expensive to do an actual play show. And a lot of people don't seem to realize that, especially when folks try to raise money. And they go, why do you need that much money? I'm like, here's a list. And I just get that gif with the scroll that goes like down the hall (laughs) of all the things you have to pay for. Um, But the good thing is, you know, like I still enjoy role playing. Yes, it's work now. But I still enjoy it. I still get, I enjoy getting told story. And especially now, because everyone involved that is on screen, we're all friends. We get to know each other. And, you know, we care about the story we're telling, remote or not. You know, that half hour before we go live, that hour afterward where some of us hang out and chat, I wouldn't give that up for anything. Especially right now, right? Like you said, pandemic times, it's hard to spend time with people. And so, yeah, honestly, game time for me is a big part of that is being able to hang out with people and chat, yeah. which we don't get to do much these days. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Into the Motherlands is another show that you helped start. You recruited a bunch of really talented people around you to kind of get the thing off the ground. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Had B. Dave on and he kind of talked through uh, the game design part of it. But yeah, I'd love to hear from like an overall show perspective, kind of the work that went into it. And then maybe what lessons you learned from Rivals that helped make Into the Motherlands the success that it is. Motherland started, you know, I was pitching ideas to Twitch and, you know, they were like, there's already plenty of fantasy. There's already plenty of d and I was like, fair. And I'd actually pitch Star Trek because there's an official RPG mm. for it. They were a little iffy because of IP, but also without knowing like how that work out, people would be interested. They said, how about you tell your own story? And I was like, what? And they're like, tell your own story. Because I grew up on sci-fi, grew up with Star Trek, Star Wars, the original Battlestar Galactica. And they were like, okay, pitch your own story. I was like, all right. So I actually uh, messaged me, Dave. We sat down with a calendar I went, oh, we have to work really fast if we're going to make this happen. Wait, was it like six weeks or something to get the whole thing yeah. ready? Yeah. <laughs> to build a game. and Well, because we're like, oh, we have all this time. They, You know, it's early in the year and they want stuff by the end of the year. So we're like, oh. And then when we sat down on the counter, we're like, oh, that's actually really not that much time. Yeah. So we got it together. We got our cast together. And, you know, knock on wood, people loved it. And that first season was 12 weeks, three hours each. It was great. It was a bonding experience. We got to tell a great story. And, you know, the fact that people really, really wanted more of it when we were done was great. You know, we did a second season. And then middle of second season, we did our Kickstarter. So the book is being developed. It gave us a chance to flesh out this world and IP that we've created. Got through season three, did a live show at San Diego Comic-Con last year's special edition and now we're just kind of waiting on a yes no from twitch which is the hardest part and because last time we had a yes but we had to sit on that yes for a very long time so that's the hard part of that nda life of you know that things will happen but you can't say that things will happen so yeah and the things i learned from rivals you know like i learned about producing production value you know the worth of what to pay people because, you know, a lot of people, when we ask them, hey, what's your rate? Folks that do this all the time had a much higher rate and folks that had never done this or they hadn't done it often. They're like, oh, 50 bucks. And I'm like, an hour? And they're like, oh, no, for the whole thing. I'm like, absolutely not. I'm not paying you <laughs> just $50 for three hours work. What's wrong with you? And also just negotiating and learning how to write a contract because I had to do all of that. Twitch was basically like, here's some money. Go forth and do the thing. And I was like, oh, right. great. 
So learning how to write an NDA, all that other stuff from Rivals. Because we had a overall contract with Watsi mm-hmm. for Rivals, and that's with them versus my name is the one on this contract. And also just learning not to stress out and some things are just out of your control. Like if the internet goes out, I can't do anything about it. And, you know, patience, because I'm not a patient person at all. I was born three weeks early. That's how impatient I am. Also, B. Dave and I have the same philosophy about business is business. I can be your buddy. Like we've signed this contract. We're good. Now we're going to go get a beer and making sure that everybody understood that this is business. This is work. And being able to articulate that to people that I enjoy, that I like, but also being able to to have that clear marker of, okay, we've signed on the odd line. We're good. Get me your invoice. Now we can go back to friendship and telling the story, et cetera. Yeah. Did you have to delegate a lot of the stuff that was happening or did you handle most of it yourself? For the show, I, I did most of it myself because the contract was with Twitch and I signed it for the book work. B. Dave, Gabe Hicks, and I split up a lot of stuff. Vanessa, who's our art director, sent out contracts for that. And then B. Dave was on contracts for most of the folks who brought on for the book development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And knowing that you're a Star Trek fan, uh, I see a ton of influence in the type of story that you were telling. That makes a lot of sense. And it was really cool. Loved the, the whole new story idea. Loved the kind of the origins of where all the people came from uh, with Mansa Musa. I haven't really seen a lot of stuff like that before, you know, so very unique and interesting. And they led to a lot of really cool story moments. Yeah. Yeah. That's me, Dave. Cause I'm the worst history student ever. <laughs> <laughs> He's a sharp one. Tell us a little bit about, I need diverse games where the idea came from and what you set out to accomplish and how it's been going. So I need diverse games came mostly out of spite and uh, being (laughs) irritated with the games industry. I went to GDC in 2014 with a friend who wanted to get in the industry. And then later that year, I started seeing a lot of the games that we'd seen either, you know, about to come out, a three over the years, et cetera. And they were all the same scruffy white dude protagonist. And I started tweeting out, I need diverse games. It'd be great to see people like me. And when Firewall caught on, uh, shout out to Mickey Kendall as always, who shared a lot of those tweets and also made sure to credit where the hashtag started. Mm -hmm. It was right time, right place, lightning in a bottle. You know, it grew. People wanted to talk about it. It was the right time to have the diversity conversation again. And, you know, went into interviews, being on podcasts, starting a podcast. It eventually became a second job. And then I lost my day job in 2015. So I was like, all right, I'm going to give it a go. If this can take off and be my day job, so be it. And if it doesn't, Oh, well. And, you know, it was, again, right time, right place. People came through and supported. Became my full-time gig as of, like, 2016. But I still do consulting work. I still stream. Because uh, diversify everything. Don't rely on one income stream. Because one thing I discovered is people will take net 30, 45, and 60 to pay you. So you can do a lot of projects. You may not see that money for one to three months. Yeah. That's a lot of rent that you need to have. <laughs> paying yeah you're absolutely right but yeah it became its own thing and now we're kind of just in a holding pattern because of again corona there was an opportunity to go to pax but a i wasn't at pax east but for me it's one thing too i personally am going to take a calculator risk and get on a plane and go somewhere right because it's work it's business not just to go but i didn't feel comfortable asking anyone to expose themselves or potentially expose themselves By sitting in the diverse lounge, especially since people are relaxing masks so much, because you have no control over what someone does once they leave the venue. So someone could be good and mask up while they're in the venue. We don't know. They could have been maskless this whole time and begrudgingly put one on to come in. There has been an opportunity to return to the diversity lounge. I don't have it in my conscience to ask someone to take that risk right now. Once we're at a point where Corona is more endemic, where it's like, okay, we know every year you got to get a booster shot, but it's not like if I cough on you, I could kill you. There were quite a few people I saw tweeting out positive after getting home from PAX, so I don't blame you at all. Yeah. Well, that, you know, and unfortunately that poor enforcer died. Yeah, that's true. I forgot about that. Yeah, I didn't hear about it until I got back, but, you know, there's also the fact of, 
there is no nuance. And a lot of people feel like if you went to PAX, you don't care about anyone else. But for me and other people like me that are on panels and have a booth, if you don't go to PAX, you don't make money. And if you don't make money, your business may shut down. I don't go to cons just to go. I've never been a, my vacation time is going to PAX. That's never been me. If you see me at a show, I'm working. Yeah, especially because it is your job, right? It, it is your, your business, yeah. Recently, you were the recipient of the Gaming Icon Award as part of the Gaming Awards 2022. That's spelled G-A-Y-M-I-N-G. So uh, don't confuse it with gaming listeners. This is a hard thing to describe. So yeah, Gaming Icon. Um, what does it mean to get that kind of recognition for your hard work in the industry? I was a little floored because it's a funny story. I got the news while I was streaming. Yeah. And, you know, it was like, you can't tell anyone. You need to get on a call as soon as you're free. Because with the time difference, it was like early in the morning for me. I had to catch myself because I almost burned it out while I was live. And then I had to sit on the news for like a month. It was humbling because I don't do this to get recognition. I don't, right. I'm clearly not doing this to get rich. I'm not doing this to get famous. But it's nice to have the acknowledgement, but it's not why I do it. And, you know, it's a very pretty ward. It's going to sit on my shelf and be behind me. Yeah. It's touching. It's also a reminder. You know, it isn't like, ooh, look at me. I'm special. It's a, there are people who believe in what you're doing. There are people who yeah. thought enough of you to nominate you for the work that you've put in over the last eight years. And that's humbling. I'm not doing this for the accolades because what i've noticed is when people do stuff for the accolades a those accolades never come because people can see through you mm -hmm. i'm doing it because this is what i have put my time and self into for eight years there's a, still a need for it and if nothing else i would love to put myself out of business i would love to have an industry where it isn't needed but you and i know that we may never see that as long as we're around that's true there's still a long way to go what advice do you have for the aspiring creators out there uh, who are creating in the tabletop space? People out there who are struggling, uh, who could use a, a boost or some good advice from someone who's been doing it a lot longer than them. First off, be a decent person. Don't be a social climber. Don't be a coattail writer. Because one, people notice two, people talk and the industry is very small. Get your mind off of, I want to DM like and fill in the blank. Because, you know, B. Dave said this too, yeah. you are you, only you can tell your story. You can't DM like Matt or B. Dave or Bria or Jasmine or me or anyone else. You can DM like you and figure out what you're good at, what your storytelling style is and work on that. Work on your storytelling, what it is you're good at, what you like to do and focus on building that versus trying to be like Matt or Bria or B Dave or anyone else because you can only ever be you. And you know, it, it sounds easy to say, but don't get caught up on numbers because there are a billion D D shows out there on Twitch, on YouTube, podcasts. Do something different. If you like Blue Rose, if you like Dragon Age, if you like Vampire the Masquerade, go do that. There's not a flood of those shows for one, for two. People can tell when you are doing something in the hope of getting clicks versus you actually like what you're doing. You know, I had a ton of fun being the DM for Rivals for season eight, but I also had way more fun DMing Dragon Age, mostly because I know that property inside and out because I'm that big nerd. And you can tell the difference, not like, oh, I'm angry and I hated DMing Rivals, but there's a difference because... You know, D&D has been around not quite as long as I have, because I, I think I've got a year on D&D. &D. And people feel like if they don't do D&D, &D, they're never going to get recognition. Try other systems for the love of God. Go play Blades and Dark. Go play Cypher System. Go play something else. And don't tie yourself solely to D&D, &D, which, hey, Watsy, if you're listening, oh, well, I can't help you. But everyone feels like if I don't play D&D, &D, no one's going to watch me. No one's going to interact with my content. Be interesting. Do something besides D and D for the love of God, and also don't be afraid to experiment. Or if you must play D and D, homebrew something, make something new. 
Yeah, I think the advice to do something different is very, very good and poignant. Uh, like you said, uh, I feel like I see new shows popping up like every day. And unless you're going to do something that nobody else has done yet, it's hard to carve out a space and to really do what you're you're setting out to do. So great, great advice there. And also, I I think that people from WotC probably also play other games too. So hopefully they don't. They didn't take that. You know, what's funny is I get people like, but you're under contract with WotC. And I'm like, I'm under contract. They don't own me. There's nothing saying that I can't ever tell people to play something beside D&D. People that work on it, people, you know, that are so well known for D&D say go play other things. It's okay. If anything, it makes you better at running games, right? Trying Mm -hmm. new systems, trying new things, learning new ways of looking at games. Yeah, I think. You can't hurt anything by broadening your horizons, for yep. sure. All right. Advice for people who are running games. Uh, anything in particular that you've been told or that you've kind of thought up yourself as good advice for running games? Well, obviously, you have safety tools. Do a session yep. zero. If it is going to be a stream game, I would suggest even streaming your session zero if everyone consents to it. Because hmm. we actually did that with Motherlands. We did our session zero, our character yeah. building. That was really good, too, because it helped me familiarize myself with the system and and with all of the different classes and stuff that, sorry. Professions. uh, Professions. Yeah, I was like, nope, that's not what they called it. (laughs) But, you know, the other thing is don't overprepare, which I know sounds trite and people get nervous and they write like 20 pages of notes and understand that your players are probably going to ruin any plan you have. Not maliciously, but... They may see an interesting NPC that you didn't even give a name to, that you haven't thought about beyond the one thing they're going to say in the bar or the tavern on the road or whatever. What I did to prepare for Rivals and most DMing that I do is I keep a running Google Doc with story beats that I want to hit. So if like for Dragon Age, it was a three hour show. I knew, okay, this happened last week. I'd like to resolve X, Y, and Z. But if we don't get to X, Y, and Z, one of those can stay in my pocket till next week. And if the players totally diverge, I'm just going to run with it because people think, oh, I can't improv. I can't think on my feet. I am terrible at improv. I failed my improv class in college. (laughs) Just if you have the trust with people you're at the table with, it will come to you. And part of it is just learning everyone's style, learning your style, getting comfortable and be okay with making a mistake. You know, no one's ever going to hold your feet to the fire because you had to look up a rule. I mean, we've all seen Matt stop and look up something on his phone or in a physical book live Mm -hmm. ask people to read out spells yeah he does it so you know and matt if you hear this please don't yell at me (laughs) Um, (laughs) but you know we but people hold up everything and they say like the mercer effect and all this other stuff just again remember you are not matt you're not b dave you're not a bria you're not jasmine you're not me or gabe or anyone else you are you And if anyone has memorized the PHB and the DM's guide, more power to you. I can't remember anything. I always have to look up spells before I use them as a player, let alone as a DM. It's there as a guide. It's not written in stone. Yeah, 100%. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Tanya. Uh, To wrap things up, any upcoming projects you want to share with us? And then where can people find you and interact with you online? It's not written in stone because i won't know until after we recorded this but mm. there's a chance i'll be at twitchcon amsterdam which depending on what in july this could be before or after rivals is back in may may 29th if you're listening to this we should be ready to wrap up season 13 and knock on wood hopefully motherlands will be back by the time this comes out if not mm. sorry i don't want to give anyone false hope people can find me everywhere cypher of tears c-y-p-h-e-r-o-f-t-y-r that is twitch twitter instagram tiktok tumblr not pillow fort because my username is taken and not coffee because someone broke in my account and i do variety on my stream channel and actually we will have DD starting uh may 23rd every other week we are continuing our silly kitten caper but i'm taking everyone to the witch like carnival as kittens <laughs> uh no they're not kittens they had to save oh. a kitten but it turned out the person was under true polymorph so <laughs> nice nice I played in a game where the mayor of the town had been polymorphed to a rat, and we figured that out. Oh, dear. Good good times. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Well, like I said, thank you so much for joining me, Tanya. It's been a blast chatting with you, and really enjoyed a lot of the stuff that you put out. 
you've done so much work that I could not possibly have consumed it myself uh, between asking you to be on the show and now, but I tried. So it's okay. <laughs> so yeah, thanks so much and really enjoyed it. And I hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thanks. You too. Thank you for listening to the How Not to DM Season 2 finale. I'm going to be taking a couple of months off to enjoy my summer and have a few more evenings to myself and my family, but I'll be back at it for Season 3 shortly, and I've already started scheduling interviews. Stay tuned for those announcements, and in the meantime, go back and re-listen to your favorite episodes. Who knows, you may learn something new or get inspirations for your own home games. Next time you get the chance, share this episode with your friends and family around your game table. Another great way to help me boost the show is by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or rating the show on Spotify. I appreciate all of you for helping the show grow. Thank you to the team at T4C Studios for helping edit and produce this episode. My intro and outro music is by Daniel Zombo. The Quickfire Chaos music is by Exacat, and the Quickfire Chaos mood music is by Arcane Anthems. Check out the episode notes for more of their great work. And, as always, until next season... Roll some nat 20s for me.